Today's lecture is about Richard Rogers. Actually, it's one of two lectures about Richard Rogers. He's um, a very unique person in the history of the American musical in that he has really two entirely distinct eras within his career. Richard Rogers worked with one lyricist for about 25 years, a very important lyricist named Lawrence Hart. The Rogers and Hart uh, section is what we're going to talk about with this module. Uh, Rogers then, after Hart passed away, found a new collaborator named Oscar Hammerstein and wound up working on another bevy of really important and significant shows for another good chunk of time. And Rogers and Hammerstein make up a separate module which follows today's. Um, in addition to that, Richard Rogers worked with many other lyricists towards the end of his life, and I'll get into that. But really, he is probably one of the most prolific and one of the most well-known composers in the American theater. Richard Rogers was born in Hamill Station uh, near Long Island in, uh, in 1902. Uh, his father was a doctor, and uh, his mother was an amateur pianist. Um, he started playing the piano by ear when he was four. Uh, he got a little bit of instruction uh, from members of his family. Um, but, but, you know, music for him was kind of a, of a chore uh, more than anything else. He didn't like scales, he didn't like exercises or any of that. And reading music from the printed page was very difficult. Um, but he was really one of the better uh, ear musicians um, around, which is funny because he wrote so many historically important songs. Eventually he would train himself otherwise. Another major composer we talk about in here, Frank Lesser, was even more of an ear composer than, than Rogers. Uh, but for Rogers, he was really kind of, um, of, of an average guy when it came to that. Um, nonetheless, um, his, his parents believed that his brother, uh, Mortimer, uh, would probably become the more successful composer. And, and really set Mortimer up for music, and Mortimer went into medicine. Uh, Mortimer, in fact, became um, a leading uh, a guy who got a college an obstetrician, and some of the equipment that Mortimer designed is still in use today. He became a, a pioneer in his field. Um, he was still called upon, though, uh, to write songs and things for his, um, for his school. They asked him to put on a play, Mortimer, that is, at the Boys Club. And uh, he turned to his brother and said, hey, my friends are asking me for songs. This would lead to Richard Rogers' debut for writing on the stage, and he would keep writing for amateur productions from that moment forward. Um, in 1918, uh, Richard Rogers acquired a permanent working partner in Lawrence Hart, who would be his only lyricist for the next quarter of a century. Um, Lawrence Hart was uh, considerably older than Richard Rogers, and I want to point out this is how these names are spelled, by the way. Uh, Rogers was very specific about keeping the D in his last name. Uh, Lawrence Hart, it's kind of a weird spelling of his name, but that's how it's spelled. He was often referred to as Larry Hart. Um, the two of them met uh, at a party. Uh, Richard Rogers was, um, as, as he says in his, uh, in his own autobiography, he says, um, <clears throat> I, it was a case of love at first sight. I acquired in one afternoon a business partner, a best friend, and a source of permanent irritation. Uh, Rogers was only 16. Um, and he was still impressed by Hart's uh, wit, his sophistication, his cultural background, his skill at diversification, and, and his idea, his very, very specific ideas of what made a good song. Uh, Larry Hart was born in New York City in 1895, and except for a brief period at uh, DeWitt Clinton High School, his entire elementary and secondary ed education uh, took place in private schools. Uh, nonetheless, he left Columbia in 1917 without a degree. And this was kind of a sore spot for Hart. He didn't like to admit that he did not have a college degree, and he would be often very evasive about that topic. Hart was somebody who almost was considered himself a little too smart for school. He was very erudite. He had a wonderful vocabulary, and he carried himself really well, took himself to operas. He probably could have finished a degree if he had applied himself properly. And he kind of gave the impression of this widely educated gentleman, that sort of thing. Uh, brilliant intelligence, a fine cultural background, uh, embrace music, opera, as well as the theater. Uh, Rogers and Hart uh, began writing a few songs that, um, by the summer of like 1919 or so. Uh, they were bringing them uh, out to play uh, at, at, at beaches, in, in uh, Rockaway Beach, for example, and some other places. Uh, they were discovered by, surprise, a Tin Pan Alley company, which, which, which would lead to the publication of the entry of their songs into uh, the public eye. Um, it was some time before Rogers and Hart would, would uh, work together on Broadway specifically. A few things about Hart, and, and specifically about his lyrics. You will find uh, the liberal use of thee and thou, the use of high poetry, a very broad use of the English language, um, really unusual ways to say very basic things. Also, I 
I mentioned with Cole Porter that there's a sort of a, of a self-deprecation in the sense that a character presents himself in a song as being unworthy. With Hart songs, it's almost a little bit more pronounced than that. A lot of his songs mm -hmm. seem to say that the, the subject of the song, the person who's supposedly being sung to, you know, you're, you're this, you're that, you're, you're terrible, you're, for, you're bad for me, or you're unattractive, or you're not very well put together, but you're the one for me. And, and our love is so great that it can oversee the flaws that we both uh, seem to have. And, and there are a lot of really sad Rodgers and Hart ballads that kind of do this sort of thing. Um, they put together a pen name. <laughs> they call themselves uh, Richard Lawrence uh, because they decided that two pen alley companies would be more likely to pay for their songs freelance if they were only paying one person. And so they would pick one of themselves to go and represent themselves in different companies rather than just work with one of those uh, publishers. They, they got a little bit discouraged when uh, producers and publishers decided that they weren't terribly interested in what they were doing. Um, uh, Hart was about to accept a job uh, as a traveling salesman for a children's underwear company. Uh, I don't know about that, but he uh, was about to accept this job when suddenly uh, they were offered the assignment to write music for one of these popular reviews, The Garrett Gaties. Uh, the success of The Garrett Gaties in the 1920s kind of established the reputation of Rogers and Hart as songwriters. Uh, during the next half dozen years, Rogers and Hart would write the, uh, the music for a lot of musical comedies. Um, particularly special shows, at first shows would come to them just for specific songs and say, would you plug this? Could you give us a, a little bit of help? These musicals weren't great. There's some titles like Dearest Enemy, America's Sweetheart. You know, they're okay, but they don't really make you remember them the way that some of these others do. But in 1930, uh, Rogers and Hart went out to Hollywood and wrote several songs for motion pictures and uh, came back to Broadway in 1934 with a little bit more of a, of a pedigree, a little bit more of a... Um, they put it, uh, uh, being trusted as a name to write for a larger production and that sort of thing. Um, there's there are a few things about about Lawrence Hart that I that I think I have to tell you up front. Um, Hart was a brilliant wit. He was a, a, a tremendous uh, poet. He was also a very damaged individual. He had a very serious alcohol problem and uh, was frequently uh, known for very self destructive behavior. Um, he was not a happy drunk at all, so to speak. He was um, uh, very frequently would go off and disappear for days on end. He developed a sort of complex feeling that he was unworthy of the fame that he and uh, Richard Rogers maybe had, had put together. And Rogers, although he was the younger of the two, would occasionally bail Lawrence Hart out of things and kind of get him back on track and be very strict with him and tell him we have a deadline. We have things to work on together. Um, ultimately, this would not lead to, this would not come to a happy end. And when we get together in the second module, I want to talk to you specifically about a couple of Rogers and Hart shows, and I'll probably wrap it up with the sad story that finishes uh, Lawrence Hart's life. But that's all in module two. You'll also find some Rogers and Hart music connected to our module, and there'll be a quiz this unit. So um, all of that ahead. But thanks for uh, listening to module one, and uh, feel free to proceed right on to module two in a moment.